if you're an entrepreneur, how do you know when it's time to give up? Now, have you ever seen somebody taking a tumble and a fall in the most embarrassing way? I mean, they're grabbing on to anyone and everything around them. They're pulling people down with them and it just looks like a hot mess. And in the process, they are injuring themselves more than they should. What did I say? And in the process, they are injuring themselves and causing more pain than if they were to fall professionally. Well, every day there is an entrepreneur doing exactly the same thing. Their businesses are failing. Some of them are holding on for dear life. But some of them don't even know their businesses are failing. So in this video, I'm going to show you, if you're an entrepreneur, how to fall professionally. And yes, that is a thing. By avoiding the three most common traps that I see entrepreneurs make. And yes, that's every entrepreneur along their journey. But first, here's a quick story. As a child, one of the first martial arts I learned was judo. It all looked fun until I saw them hitting the mat really hard. And I wondered, aren't they hurting themselves by doing this? and all of a sudden didn't look so attractive. But after some time and learning the art, I was taught how to break my fall. Because the fact is in judo and in lots of extreme sports, you are going to fall, you are going to hit the mat. And if you don't fall professionally, then it will really hurt. And the point is you are taught how to fall in a way that enables you to break that fall so that you hit the ground or the mat with less pain and less injury. But the point is you can get up and you can keep fighting. So in that sport, just like business, you absolutely have to fall. It is inevitable. But the difference between judo and business is that in business, we're not taught how to break our fall. We're not taught how to fail fast and fail cheaply so that you can minimize potential damage and you can get up and keep running your business. And using that analogy, in the sport of judo, we know you're gonna hit the mat, but entrepreneurs don't think they're gonna fail because of course you are going to be that ultra successful entrepreneur that hasn't failed, right? But actually a couple of things, these statistics, as we all know, show that nine out of 10 entrepreneurs fail, number one. Number two, most successful entrepreneurs have failed businesses before them. And the reason they're successful is because they've been able to compound the learning into the new business, which which makes it more successful. And number three, it isn't about macro failures as in the whole business failing. Every business has what I call micro failures. So that could be a failed hire, a failed marketing campaign, a failed sales call, a failed project. But with all of those things, you can minimize the time and the cost of those micro failures in order to mitigate against all of those costs becoming a macro failure. So that sounds good, Julian, but practically what can I do in my business to enable me to fail fast and fail cheap? So let me start by telling you what it doesn't look like in three simple ways. So number one is not listening to your customers. Just this morning, as I was driving into the office, I was in traffic and I was behind an Argos delivery van. And on the back of the van, it said same day delivery, seven days a week. The first thing that came into my head is, what are you lying for? The second thing that came into my head is, why are Argos promoting the solution to a problem that Amazon has solved years ago? And I had a discussion with my wife who was in the car with me about how Argos have completely missed the boat when it comes to direct to consumer everyday products, which is what Amazon have completely nailed. So I started to do a little bit of research around Argos and found that in 2016, Sainsbury's bought Argos for 1.4 billion pounds. And the reason they bought Argos is because they thought that having Argos inside the Sainsbury's store would increase the footfall into Sainsbury's, which sounds good, except that Sainsbury's were thinking about themselves and they weren't thinking about the customers. I'm sure they didn't ask any of the customers, if we have an Argos in our store, would that encourage you to come in? Because if they did ask their customers that, their customers would have said, well, we have Amazon now and we don't need to leave the comfort of our own home. And the same things that Argos sells, Amazon sells, but they just sell them online. So why would we come into Sainsbury's to solve that problem? But on the flip side, not only in Amazon's earlier days did they listen to their customers, but actually they are monitoring what their customers are doing on their website and on their app all the time. And Jeff Bezos quite articulately and for many years has said that there are three things which keeps Amazon going. And that is being able to offer their customers the cheapest price, the fastest delivery and the widest range. All of those problem solution statements are customer focused. They're not about Amazon, they are about the customers. So my question to you is, when was the last time you actually spoke to your customers, you surveyed them, you 
got them to give you some critical feedback, you asked them to tell you what was amazing, what wasn't so amazing, and if it was more than six months ago, you should probably ask them again. If it was more than a year ago, then that information is probably now not relevant. The second thing is keeping an eye on your North Star metric. So for most companies, the thing that you should be thinking about is revenue and alongside revenue is profit. Now, some companies don't intend to make a massive profit because they want to reinvest all of that back into the business so that they can scale. Some businesses do need to show profit because they may be on a road to acquisition. Some businesses may just need to get lots of Instagram followers because maybe you're an influencer and that is your North Star metric. But the opposite to a North Star metric are what we call vanity metrics. It's the amount of awards you've won, <clears throat> the amount of followers you've got, the amount of high fives your friends and family give you when it's not really moving the needle forward on your business. And by not monitoring and being honest about the North Star metric and measuring it day in, day out, you will be in a slow decline and you'll be falling without you even knowing it. And the third critical thing that I see entrepreneurs doing when they are falling and failing is not taking advice. Just this morning, I had one of my advisors come to the office and he asked me about what our plans were for the next three to five years. And he listened politely to my three to five year plan before gently pushing back in a very British but professional way, but essentially telling me that I hadn't thought about a number of areas around our growth plan, which were blind spots for me, and that actually I needed to get some advisors who have been there and done that so that the growth plans that I had could be more robust. When I was a younger entrepreneur, I would have taken offense. I would have thought, well, who the hell is he? I'm the one running this business. I know the ins and outs of it, and I know the industry and where we're gonna go. But actually, when you unpack it, it's not so much about your knowledge of a particular industry, as it is mine. It's about mechanically, how do you execute a new social media plan? How do you enter into a new market? How do you grow? How do you hire? And the mechanics of those things can come from somebody else who is more experienced than you in business, even though they may not know the intricacies of your your industry, they will know some of the overall macro components of what it takes to be successful in business. And they probably would have failed lots of times along the way. So even though you haven't failed, you can benefit from the learning of someone else who has compounded failure and can share that learning with you. So in summary, whether you are in a big business or a small business, micro or macro failures are inevitable. They will happen whether you like them or not. The question is, will you fail fast and will you fail cheap? Will you fail with a hundred thousand pounds or will you fail with a million pounds? Will you fail in six months or will you fail in six years? And actually, if you have been going for six years and you've spent hundreds of thousands of pounds and something inside is telling you that maybe I am failing slowly, do not fall into the sunk cost fallacy, which I've done a video on and it'll pop up in the top corner, which essentially says that because of everything you've invested, that you now don't think you can unwind from that and the losses from the investment will be greater than future losses if you keep plowing good money after bad. Whatever time or money you've invested into something, giving up on a bad idea is actually a good idea. And in the tech community, we have cleverly come up with this word pivot, which is probably just there to protect our egos when you realize that what you're doing isn't working and you change track and you do something else. But it is a more positive way of thinking about redirection and almost admitting that, okay, the strategy that we had didn't work, it has failed, but it doesn't mean the entire business needs to fail or that the mission of the business needs to fail or that the thing that we want to provide for our customers or clients needs to be thrown in the bin. And whether it's failing fast or pivoting, the last thing I'll say on this is that you need to manage your ego because often the reason why we don't want to fail fast or fail cheaply and we are stretching it out is because we care about what other people think. And trust me, I have learned that people really don't care whether or not you fail. They've got too much going on in their own life. And really people will applaud you for making the effort anyway and will be more impressed that you have failed. You have taken some positive lessons. You've dusted yourself off and you're ready to go again. And it takes a little bit of courage to admit that what you've done hasn't worked and that you've got to empty your head of what you know and step into the unknown into the next part of your journey. But for me, that's the exciting bit. And with that, I'll catch you on the next video, Ultra and Out.